Good morning, everybody. I see people hopping on here. I see Dina. Um, maybe that's all I see right now. So regardless, hi, Dina. Good morning. I see you. Uh, I, I know other people are going to hop on. I'm going to jump right into this. Uh, again, good morning, everybody. We are going to uh, cover something fun kind of today. Um, you know, a lot of times we do trainings and I'm always concerned about um, something called overtraining sometimes. And so I try to mix in uh, some fun stuff. I think this is fun. Hopefully you guys will as well. Um, you know, these are kind of my notes on, on uh, what I'm going to talk about today. But this is, uh, this is training that is, uh, in my opinion, um, it, it's, it's fun. It's very interesting to me to understand how you influence somebody for a sale, for a listing, for a uh, helping out a buyer, or maybe even helping someone find a rental that you're getting paid a commission on. And that's really the common theme with all of this is, you know, it's, it's good to know these things uh, so that uh, you increase your ability to help out your clients, to be of service to your clients. So uh, sometimes I'm reminded of that by um, Heather that, you know, all of this isn't about making money. It's really about helping clients and servicing clients. And she's absolutely right. So uh, the result may be uh, financial, but really at the end of the day, that's what we're looking to do. So what I just thought I would do, we will uh, keep the, the call somewhat light as compared to the last uh, several that we've gone into some pretty deep stuff. And today what we're going to do is we will cover, we will cover, hold on one second. Boom. We will cover um, uh, 20 powerful sales techniques. We're going to keep it light. And this stuff is backed by science. So I'll, I'll go through this stuff and then I'll, I'll kind of get your thoughts at the end here. So number one, as uh, you know, when people pop on, that's great. I'll just keep rolling. But number one, contact your lead within five minutes. How long do you wait to contact leads? Uh, science shows us that buyers are more likely to make a purchase uh, the closer in time to when uh, they made the initial inquiry. So this could be a phone call. It could be uh, capturing a lead off of a website. It could be, uh, you know, placing an ad on Facebook, uh, you know, all kinds of ways. But when you get that hit from them, you've got to contact them back within five minutes. Uh, minutes or they automatically stop start to drop their interest level. Some realtor agents uh, see leads coming in and wait till they have a free moment later to respond. If you do this, then I feel that you're making a big mistake. Always respond to the sales leads in some fashion. And research by the Lead Response Management Group found that you're a hundred times, look at this, a hundred times more likely to successfully contact a lead if you respond within five minutes and 21 times more likely to qualify that lead. And that's what we do as real estate agents and brokers <clears throat> is not only do we respond, but we want to make sure they're qualified and, and to qualify them with the ability to buy your service. Uh, after all, you're a real estate agent. So you're either buy, sell, rent. Those are our clients. And you are qualifying them to uh, uh, be able to get that job done. So one example of that would be, hey, are you qualified to buy a house for 250000 like you're interested in? That type of thing. So uh, number two, by the way, got my coffee ready to go here. Number two, I don't know why coffee is such an important thing on our webinars here, but it's important for me. Maybe that's why. Uh, number two. Uh, so, oh, contact here. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to put this in there. I had this set up this morning. Contact lead within five minutes of them contacting you. Very important. 
Very, very important there. Okay, number two. And by the way, all of this will be an agent broker blueprint. These are my notes to it. So uh, they're a little scattered, but you'll have all of this. No problem. Good thing to go over and review. Number two, make six attempts to reach leads. Make at least, I'll put at least six attempts to reach leads. Very, very uh, important that you understand that uh, persistence is really the key here. Uh, persistence is really the key and understanding, you know, how to get a successful lead to closure, either, you know, if they're a buy, sell, rent client, um, being persistent. That means calling them back six times once they've reached out to you at a minimum of six. I've even heard eight in some cases. So I will change that uh, six to eight uh, times is going to be really, really important. Number three, call early morning or late afternoon. Call early morning or late afternoon. Now, something is has been a very interesting that's going on uh, right now in uh, as we're in the middle of this uh, pandemic. Um, what's interesting is work habits are changing. And the thing that I've noticed about work habits is, uh, number one, you know, obviously you've got hustlers out there that are going to make it happen regardless. They're up early, they're hustling right away, you know, they're taking calls, things like that. <coughs> um, the, but with a lot of this work at home scenario, uh, what is happening is, uh, let me just get a couple people muted there. There we go. Uh, what is happening with this uh, work at home is this is going to be the new normal. This is going to be actually the new way that we're working. I've heard from uh, the CEO of Morgan Stanley. I've heard from uh, other CEOs in the WeWork space, the CEO of WeWork as well. And they're saying they're, they're re vamping and looking at everything. Um, the CEO of Morgan Stanley said, if you would have told me in January that we would have 90%, 90% of, you're talking tens of thousands of people here working from home and it would work uh, even in cases better than what it was doing before, he would have been, he would have said, absolutely not. And lo and behold, we, we are there. I think that means for real estate, commercial real estate, I think it's going to be a big hit. I remember um, when this thing first came on, um, I was talking to some colleagues in California and they said, well, why are you being so negative? <laughs> they sent that to me and I, I said, I don't know. You know, I've studied real estate for a long time. I've, of course, as you guys know, I've written books on it and I've, uh, I've, uh, I, you know, my, my, with my degrees and things, I, I just, that's what I look at. And there's no way that you can shut down the American public like that from a commerce sense and expect it to come back to normal. And then when you add on the, um, you know, uh, hygiene and health and things like that, it's not going to be the same. So office buildings are going to change. Uh, the Manhattan, New York city going to change, uh, real estate values are going to change. Commercial real estate and retail gonna change. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, if, if you want more insight on that, I'll be glad to help give you my thoughts. Which, you know, uh, I'm not the be all end all expert here, as I heard uh, someone say yesterday. But uh, at the same time, I've I've seen a lot of this, and I've I've done a lot of work in this space. So anyway, that's just my thoughts. But call early morning or late afternoon. I think that could be changing. That's the study today. But I think you might be better off. And this is something that you might want to do trial and error is call later in the morning. So if you got somebody working from home, uh, my my imagination is kind of extrapolating to that as the new norm. And I think people are going to you know, get their kids up, get them going on e-learning, get them going off to whatever hybrid school uh, situation may be happening here in the future. Um, uh, and doing some light uh, house things and then getting to work around 9 30 10 o'clock uh, but they're going to be more efficient I think the work at home space is going to be more efficient for people uh, in the long run they'll work less hours they'll be happier in doing it remember they don't have a commute they don't have expenses of a commute 
They don't have to deal with office politics as much, uh, that type of thing. There'll be other challenges, no doubt about it, but I just think this is going to change. But for now, we're going to leave it here, uh, this scenario, call early morning. Uh, but I think the uh, call early morning may change to later in the afternoon, or sorry, later in the morning. Late afternoon is still fine, but um, just my thoughts on that. Again, I, I find this stuff fascinating. Uh, call on Wednesdays, uh, Wednesdays or Thursdays. Now, let me explain this. Uh, this is what I put on our Anton uh, Facebook page, uh, kind of thing, and science has uh, talked about this. There's also days that you want to list a property. <clears throat> We're not going to talk about that now, but there's science that backs that it's better to list a property on a Sunday rather than a Friday. Most people list on Thursday, Friday because they went the weekend. It's better to hit on Sunday. Um, and I'll maybe we'll do a call on that this next uh, in the next few weeks of why that is, but when you're calling from a sales aspect, not listing a property, but calling from a sales aspect, call on Wednesdays or Thursdays. Um, so let's look at that. Do you uh, schedule your calling days when you have time or when the buyers have time? That's an interesting question. The scientific research shows that buyers will be more responsive on some days rather than on others. Unsurprisingly, Mondays aren't that great to call buyers, but did you know that Tuesday is just as bad? <clears throat> the best day to call for you will be will differ by industry, of course. Real estate uh, is going to be Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, so make sure that you do your research and understand the standard week of buyers. However, data shows us that midweek uh, to just before the end of the week is the best time to call. That is appropriate to what we do here. Uh, real estate Wednesdays and Thursdays are your call days. So when I when I when I state this, what I would do, and you guys can do whatever you want, obviously, uh, but what I would do is I would kind of plan my week out. Uh, Mondays might be researching my market. Tuesdays might be marketing, setting up and getting my marketing going. Wednesdays and Thursdays, I'm cold calling. I'm uh, calling uh, uh, initial call to leads. Unless you get a lead you know, on a Monday that's contacting you, contact, call them back within five minutes. But make Wednesdays and Thursdays your massive call day, whether it's a cold calling day or whatever it is, uh, or text marketing, whatever it is, that would be the day to do that. You're going to have better luck and science uh, tells us that. Number five, I see this, um, and you guys probably see this too, call from a local number. So we are in three states, Illinois, Indiana, and Florida. Uh, I see this happen a lot in Florida, more so than Indiana and Illinois. Florida is a transient state, uh, as you guys know. Uh, a lot of people move there from other parts of the country, but yet they keep their same number. And so what's interesting <clears throat> from the psychology standpoint is when somebody's calling from outside the area code that you're focused on, immediately you think it's a, uh, uh, you know, someone's trying to do telemarketing or telesales. It's a sales call. Uh, it's gotten so bad that a lot of these numbers that are chosen for local numbers by these companies, telesales companies, are in the area code, but they have a weird number to them. Like they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, I'll just use Chicago. They're 773-200-1904. You know, that's a tele, you know, you almost know that's a telesales call. So uh, try to pick a number that's not so obvious is the lesson there, okay? Number six, uh, we talked about this uh, before, um, but smile and be positive when you're on the phone, um, you know, what are the first words out of your mouth when you start speaking to a buyer? When I say buyer, guys, I'm meaning uh, buy, sell, rent. Those are your clients. I haven't cleaned this up yet, but I will. Um, it's small talk, right? Or chit chat. So you might think that making a comment about how terrible the weather is makes no difference, but it can actually have a, no a, a knock on negative effect on your likelihood to make a sale. 
If you had a bad morning, keep it to yourself. As scientific research shows that starting with a positive comment will be more profitable to you. One study from tipping.org found that waiters who simply said good morning to their hotel guests are get, uh, and gave a positive weather forecast were able to boost their tips by 27% just by saying good morning. It looks like the weather is going to really work out for us today. Later today, we're going to have a beautiful day uh, kind of thing. Improve their tips by 27%. That's pretty cool. And and that's why I like this idea about science and how it helps not only people in other industries with sales, but, you know, we're all real estate agents and brokers here. So this is where it makes the most sense uh, for you guys just to, Just to think about these little things when you're talking to somebody, it really makes a big difference. Don't talk bad about the competition. Um, So bad about the competition. This is something that I see sometimes agents do. uh, And I just don't think it's a good practice. I think there's a lot of companies out there. There's probably some really good companies and some really bad properties, uh, companies and properties too. But there's no need to, to kind of exploit that to get a sale. Um, keep it to yourself uh, kind of thing. I think, you know, if you're going to talk bad about a company, chances are you probably talk bad about people as well. And I think other, you know, people that you're trying to uh, convey your skill set as a real estate agent and broker to can pick up on that. So I would just say leave it. I don't think it'll help you at all. Uh, It probably will hurt you more than help you. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, Don't talk bad about the competition, no matter how bad it gets. Uh, If you're with a client and they're already working with a competitor and you are um, trying to get their business um, and the, the, the client is talking about how bad the competition is, um, almost put it <clears throat> like this, say, well, let me ask you a question in a perfect world. How would you have liked that situation to have gone? Or you might say something like this. Um, that's unfortunate. Well, here's what we can do. And here's how we would approach that situation. So you're redirecting the client from that negative news to something more positive and how you're actually going to ultimately help them with their problem. Remember, our whole sales protocol here at Anton is to help your client with their problem. If we can service more clients and help more clients, um, you're you're probably going to have more sales, more listings, more buyers to help find a home and, uh, you know, maybe even more renters if that's what you're working on. Number eight, uh, even though we're on the phone, remember the power of um, body language. Body language. Now, this is important. Remember the power of body language. Even though you're on a phone, think about your body language. You might think about that when you're a person with somebody, but body language on the phone is just as important. So as a salesperson, I'm sure that you think carefully about the words you use, but how much attention do you pay to your body language? <clears throat> Countless studies have come to the conclusion that the effective nonverbal communication is essential for shaping your buyer's behavior. Let me just kind of focus on that. Shaping <laughs> shaping your buyer's behavior. What you are doing there is you are influencing your buyer in a positive way. You're not doing anything negative here, but you're influencing that buyer to use your service as a real estate agent or broker to help them with their problem, buy, sell, rent. So remember your body language when you're in person. Body language sometimes is even more important than the words you speak. And when you're on the phone with them, body language is just as important as well. So make sure you're sitting up, make sure you're you know, leaning forward, uh, that type of thing. Um, it, it, it really conveys through the phone. Remember, communication is more than just verbal. We've gone through this in other uh, webinars, and I just wanted to bring it up here because science tells us that um, you know, it does make a huge difference. In one study presented by Vanessa Van Edwards, 
She looked at salespeople who had received just a single training session on using their body language to reinforce their verbal messages. The study found, watch this, that salespeople who effectively use body language increased their sales numbers by 56%. That's huge. So again, just kind of remember where you are in the situation. Are you leaning forward? Are you, uh, you know, kind of in a positive manner? Are you slumped over? Are you, you know, lethargic with your body? Um, that type of thing. That really uh, does make a huge difference. And you don't, you don't want to go too far too. You don't want to be aggressive, right? You don't want to be like, you know, um, cowering over somebody and, and intimidating them. So just play it cool, man, but be positive and, and be a positive energetic. That's why for some people, not everybody, but for some people, um, you know, exercise in the morning helps. I tend to exercise more in the midday, but some people do it in the morning. What helps me, be honest with you, just I'll let you, let you inside my little secret here. Uh, we are, we put in a, um, I put in, when I build houses and we do our flips and things, one of the cool uh, features that I'll put in a master bedroom shower is a steam shower. For me, I don't know what it is. Like, I know I'm getting older. I've, uh, my body is pretty wrecked up. I played in, uh, I don't know how many high school basketball games. I played in like 140 some college basketball games. So my body, sometimes I wake up and my body is just, it doesn't want to have good body language. It wants to be like, I'm hurt. (laughs) So, um, uh, for me, though, the steam shower, like that just, it gets my body like, you know, in a, a good state, a really good state. And um, so I, I, whatever that is for you, it could be a steam shower, it could be exercise, it could be just cognizant of, you know, how you want to, um, you know, kind of position yourself. But it does, it's a big to-do. It's a big deal, okay? So number nine, we all know this, use social media to sell. I want to I wanna kind of um, uh, t- touch base with that to sell. A lot of people, they use social media as, um, <coughs> as um, a casual thing, and that's totally cool. But if you follow anything that Gary Vaynerchuk says, people love him, people hate him. Um, I like them, I like the energy. Uh, but one thing that resonates with what he talks about is coffee is the other thing, by the way, that gets me in my body language, right? Maybe the caffeine in it. But one thing Gary Vaynerchuk says in his messages is you have to follow the attention. And so the attention is social media today. This is where it's at. You know, if you're not getting your message out over the phone to people, then you're not going to be as effective. That's why, uh, you know, I really have people promote their personal website. I really have people promote themselves. This isn't necessarily about Anton. This is about you as an agent and promoting you. I will help you with this. We will help you with this if you want. Um, Uh, but you've got to get to social media. That's where the attention is today. I don't believe it'll be there forever. Just like billboards aren't as effective. TV is not as effective. Radio is not as effective as the phone today or social media. There will be something that takes the place of that. But right now people's attention are there and you've got a lot to think about with social media because there's a lot of channels. There's channels that uh, approach different demographics. You know, Facebook is different than than the demographic for Facebook is different than the demographic for, say, TikTok, for instance. I did my first TikTok video. You do not want to find it on the internet, by the way. It was a disaster. Uh, but uh, that demographic is a little different than Facebook. So Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, you know, all these different channels, LinkedIn, all these different channels are really good. Think about what's appropriate for your market, where you're at, and then use the technology. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the head of Facebook, I just watched the social, um, uh, what was it? Social Connection? I forget the movie. I just watched it the other night. We've been watching a ton of movies at night during this whole uh, uh, shutdown. But uh, one of the things I know with that is the technology in there to get to people. The reason that that data was so important 
early on is they said, we got to sell ads. We got to sell ads. <clears throat> and there was one point in the movie where Mark Zuckerberg had a conflict with his uh, early on initial partner in the business. The initial partner as a CFO said, we got to sell ads. And Mark Zuckerberg is like, wait, we need to, we need to get the message out more. We don't even know what we have. But one of the things that they were doing was collecting data. And that data is real powerful today to be able to sell through social media. If you're doing, for instance, ads on Facebook, ads on LinkedIn, things like that. Watch this though. A recent study by social sales expert, Jill, Jim, Jim Keenan uh, found that 78.6% of salespeople use social media to sell out perform to sell, outperform those who weren't using social media. We're approaching 80% there. That is huge. The next one here, watch this. A study published by Harvard Business Review found that 40% of salespeople that regularly use LinkedIn can attribute revenue to their use of social network. So again, this is a big thing. If you haven't done that, I know sometimes it's a little intimidating. Some of you do a great job. Others haven't really started yet, or you just do it, use it casually. You may want to think about stepping that up, building a business page for yourself or biz, building a realtor page for yourself. And like I said, become the market expert. Um, video is just huge. Obviously, you know, that's a theme of mine. <clears throat> but video is just huge. Uh, you know, 30 to uh, 60 second videos, if you do one every day about the market, or sometimes even about nothing, but get people's attention. Uh, collect data, collect people like Facebook did early on, and that's really what made the difference with that company. You can do the same thing and have the same success with, with social media as well. Uh, number 10, be the driver. Now, what does that mean? Well, do you come across as passionate to your buyers? Um, uh, we all, uh, if you're in Agent Blueprint, you know the first module that we do is we are uh, putting you in a position to find out about your personality and find out how you can understand the personalities of the people around you and to the clients that you have coming in. So, uh, Dina, not to uh, uh, use you as an example here, but I know you're on the webinar. Uh, Dina just took her uh, test and she is a blue. And so when I know she's a blue, I know how she's thinking. By the way, I'm a blue. So Dina, we're the same person there. You're either, if you've taken the test, you know you're either a, a gold, a purple, gold, blue, or red. Um, blues are the big thinkers. Uh, they're the, um, you know, the big picture people. Uh, they're not details. They leave the details up to a gold. Um, Red are the action takers, and, and purple are the uh, feeling people, making people feel good, passionate. <clears throat> you need all these people, and you're all these colors, but are you the driver here? Do you come across as passionate to your buyers? Uh, the science identified people with personality type known as drivers that conveyed an overwhelming desire to succeed. They're competitive, optimistic, and uh, ambitious. Anyone can work on these skills, but if, you, if you're hiring new salespeople, and I understand most of you aren't, then you'll want to make sure that these qualities are already present. A, studies by, a study by Arpendio uh, looked at 80 years of sales research and discovered that the top salespeople exhibit the traits of drivers, competitive, optimistic, ambitious. In contrast, underperforming salespeople can cost uh, over six figures annually in salary, training dollars, and lost sales to employers. So what does that mean? That means that on our personality test, you want to make sure that you're, you're thinking about bringing out the red in you. The red is the ambitious person. That's why red are great salespeople. Matter of fact, in the uh, personality test that we have here, you'll note that one of the tra uh, uh, occupation of red dominantly is sales. So understand what a red does and kind of exploit that a little bit. I find it interesting when I put here, hire new salespeople. Um, what you could do is just bring some people, people on your team that might be a little bit more red than you. Or you could program your mind to, if you listen to 
more people that are read on the internet with podcasts and things like that, it might get you to think a little bit different. The bottom line here is just to be aware, have self-awareness of who you are, where you might need some help, and in what you can do. I'm a blue, my next dominant color is red, so I have a little bit more of that than than maybe some other people. But nevertheless, if if uh, just think about this, if you haven't taken that personality test, go back and take it. It's really, really interesting. And it's really a great way to understand how you operate within your core group of people. And also how you're going to operate when you're with uh, potential salespeople. Uh, number 11, enjoy the competitive nature uh, of sales. En- enjoy the competitive nature. I, I love it. I, I um, <laughs> uh, So you guys may know, maybe you don't know, I played college basketball for four years, and uh, I had a coach that um, – would tell us in the locker room, you know, we'd be in a a halftime at a heated game and he would tell us, you go, guys, you won't, you won't experience anything like this ever in your life. Um, We had a couple guys go on to play pro basketball, but for the most people in that locker room, uh, we we weren't going to experience that any time in our life. Again, that type of competition. And so he goes, uh, I remember him saying, if you join YMC league, YMCA leagues or park leagues, or you're just never going to find this type of competition. And I remember that. And he's right. For me, business became that competition. And uh, you're not always competing against other teams. Sometimes you're competing against yourself. Sometimes you're competing against, like in today, Mother Nature uh, and, and outside influence. But what I do know is sales is kind of competitive. I look at it like this competition. We have some leads that come in. How do we close those? How do we outpace our competition in a positive way where we help our clients in a, in a positive way? When there's a, a problem, when there's a property to, to buy, sell, rent, there's a problem to solve. And that's when we go to action. So I love the competitive nature Uh, of sales. A 2003 study by marketing professor uh, Bilal Krishnan uh, and his colleagues tested 182 salespeople and found that competitive cause, sorry, competitiveness caused salespeople to work harder and outperform their peers. So competition is good. When can it turn bad? When you revert to things like, you know, talk bad about your competition to get you Uh, ahead. You don't want to do that. Or uh, when you're driving yourself to the ground and you don't have a nice balance there. Uh, The 11th module in Agent Broker Blueprint, we talk about balance. And, you know, the balance with your family, the balance with other businesses you have, the balance with your overall relationships are going to be real important. So you don't want to be so competitive that you drive those into the ground. Um, Number 12, optimism. Optimism is a really, really powerful thing. You've got to say, uh, well, you don't have to, but you should say yes to that. That's being optimistic um, in the first place, right? So when you look at a glass, is it half empty or half full? You might be wondering what the answer to this question can have on sales, but the science is crystal clear. Psychologist Martin uh, Seligman and his colleagues were the first to study optimism in salespeople. Over 30 years of research involving more than a million salespeople confirms that optimism is a valuable attribute. Their most notable research was in 1986 when Martin Seligman uh, and Peter Shulman tested 14,000 applicants at Metropolitan Life's, um, sorry, applicants at Metropolitan Life for optimism. The results showed that optimists consistently outsold pessimists. Uh, This wasn't a one-off either, as they were able to repeat the results in 1995 uh, study uh, involving salespeople across several industries, including office products, real estate, banking, and car sales. They found conclusively that optimists outsold pessimists by between 20 and 40 percent. Um, we've got a lot of negativity going on in the world. I'm telling you, it's going to be okay. We will be okay. Um, that's what we do as human beings. I think this is just my personal opinion. 
But I think if we uh, kind of have a, a solution to all this is uh, respecting Mother Nature. I think we need less politicians involved in this. Uh, we need less conspiracy theories involved in this. We need a little hope, a little hard work, uh, a little understanding of science and uh, understanding of numbers, true numbers, and we're, we're going to be just fine. So I want to uh, le- uh, give everybody that optimistic message. We're going to be fine. You guys are going to be better than most, matter of fact, because you're here. Uh, how many people are training right now during this shutdown as a real estate agent? I'm telling you, not many. That's why you're going to do better than most. So uh, you guys are are, are going to be in really good shape. Number four. Did I, did I skip one? Oh, introvert. Right. Got it. So number 13, let's talk about this. Let's get it out in the open. Introvert. What does that mean? Uh, or an extrovert. Be ambivert. What does that mean? Be, be am by vert. There's so many labels today, but be ambivert. Let's understand what that means. Maybe people don't, uh, know what that means, but we're going to know here in a second. If you're an introvert, you may have heard that the extroverts make the best salespeople. Well, it's not entirely accurate as the best salespeople are neither introverted or extroverted. They're in fact ambiverts. What is an ambivert? The question is, an ambivert is someone who has both introvert and extrovert qualities and bounces between the two without committing to one or the other. For example, an ambivert enjoys being around others, but they also enjoy their time alone. Sound familiar? If so, then you're in luck. A recent study of 300 salespeople published in Psychological Sciences shared researcher Adam Grant's findings that qualities of both introverted and extroverted personalities have their place in sales. But the key takeaway from the study saw that on average, ambiverted salespeople generated 32, 32 percent more revenue than highly extroverted salespeople. So in our personality test, who are the the uh, extrovert people? The A's, or sorry, the Reds. <clears throat> the Reds. What are the Reds doing? Well, they're they're boisterous, they're loud, they're flamboyant. Um, sometimes that's a turnoff. If you're a salesperson and you're a Red, sometimes that could be a turnoff. That's why we put the personality test as in the first module, by the way, because if you can kind of understand your personality. And when to change, when to bring out the gold, when to bring out the purple, when to bring out the red. Now, you don't want to be like multiple personalities. There was a movie, I think, called Sybil that was about that way back in the day. Maybe I'm dating myself. You don't want to be multiple personalities, but you want to be clever. And you want to be clever to the extent of helping your client. And and that's when this works. Uh, Have you ever met somebody and they were so flamboyant and, and energetic that it almost scared you? Um, uh, that's what I'm talking about. If you, you're probably thinking of a person like that right now, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So be clever in this. So, uh, that's going to be an ambivert. Now we all know what that is. Number 14, be a closer consultant or expert, be a closer consultant. This is really good or expert. Now watch this. Uh, everyone has their approach to sales, but what is yours? Scientific studies have identified eight main sales approaches, approach categories, including storytellers, focusers, narrators, aggressors, and socializers. However, a study of 800 salespeople people by researcher Lynette Riles and Jane, sorry, Lane Davies found that the remaining three were the most successful, closers, consultants, and experts. <clears throat> go like this, go, hmm, isn't that interesting? The study found that experts were naturally gifted in all areas of selling, while consultants tended to focus on listening to their buyers and solving problems. Remember, our framework for our sales meeting is something called SPIN, situation, problem, implication, and what is their need. So this plays really, really well with that um, with that kind of framework that we go off of. <clears throat> Again, that stuff is in, in module five um, of the agent broker blueprint, by the way. Uh, while closer, uh, 
let me kind of go back here. Uh, while consultants tended to focus on listening to their buyers and solving problems, while closers were smooth talkers in converting the biggest leads, what they found was 37% of salespeople were deemed effective in the long run. And these three types of salespeople, closers, consultants, and experts, were among the most successful. That's pretty interesting. I love that stuff. Uh, okay, number 15. Where are we? Here we go. Number 15. Offer more than one option. Great advice. Offer more than one. <clears throat> Jeez, John. More than one option. Offer more than one option. What does that mean as a salesperson? <clears throat> so, in, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing through, we're going to be going through closes, closing statements that you can, not closing statements for real estate, John, closing statements that you can use to, to get a buy, sell, rent client, sign a listing agreement, uh, using you as a buyer's agent, whatever that is. So one of the closing techniques that you're going to know is something called the option close. And it's interesting that this came up here because we're going to be going into that in the next couple of weeks, but watch this. How many options do you give your buyers? In one, uh, one study published in the Journal of Consumer Research, Daniel McCann found that the number of product options had a big influence. One of Daniel's, <coughs> man, I don't know, I'm, I'm fine, maybe it's the coffee this morning. One of the, uh, Daniel's most famous experiments was based on consumers who were asked to purchase a DVD player. When a single DVD player was shown, only about 10% purchased. <clears throat> However, when Daniel introduced a second DVD player, the number of sales increased by 66%. Your buyers are more likely to make a purchase if they feel confident about their decision. One way to minimize the brain's perception of risk is to present more than one option so they can choose the lower risk option themselves. It, it kind of says if they do one, it's risky because they have nothing else to fall back on. If they do two, one or the other, there's always something they, they could fall back on. Psychology says this. So you might want to present more than one option when you're working with a client on a listing agreement or you're working with a client on as a buyer's rep. Um, or even a renter on a listing, you could list a property at a certain price for a certain amount of days. Or you could say this, sometimes you run into a seller and they want to list the property for more than it's worth. And so you'll say, listen, we could do this. Let's, uh, we, one option would be to list the property at the, uh, at the number that um, our comparative sales analysis, our CRM, uh, co comparative sales CMA, geez, John, uh, our CMA has told us, and uh, or we could list it at your number for 30 days, and if uh, we get no traffic or very low volume of traffic, we could then lower the price to the number that I think we should list it at. What's your choice? And so let them choose. When when you give your client the option to choose, if they feel like they have the power. When you're just giving them one option, they don't have, a, uh, they feel like they don't have the power. That's why uh, um, elections are so powerful. You know, usually at the end of the day, they're voting for, let's just say the presidential election, they're voting for A or B. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm keeping the politics out, the bias of politics out. Uh, a or B, if the community or the people that are voting feel like they have the power, they don't. It's really one choice for them because they have uh, something called um, uh, optimism bias where, uh, well, not optimism bias, but they have a bias involved that uh, they're to one side or the other. There's only one choice. A has only one choice. So if it's a Democrat running and they're a Democrat, they only have one choice. Now they might have other choices in the primary, but in that election, there's one choice. So uh, just kind of <clears throat> be uh, aware of when you're working with your buyers and sellers or renters, even for that matter, give them more than one option. It helps them feel more comfortable 
and it also helps them feel more comfortable in moving forward. 16, love this one. Act like your buyers. We all know that you're in the service industry, so act like your buyers. Put yourself in the mindset of your typical client or in the client that you're working with at that moment. Do you notice how your buyers behave and respond to you? The science that shows mirroring the gestures, expressions, and posture of someone you are speaking to can significantly increase their perception of you. Uh, This technique, known as mirroring, is mostly seen in couples, but it happens in the workplace too, at meetings, conversations, colleagues, networking, events, things like that. One study in 2009 involved a study of 60 people who were tasked with negotiating with each other. By mirroring their partner's speech and posture, they were able to reach an agreement 67% of the time, while those did not mirror their partner were only able to reach an agreement 12.5% of the time. That is really interesting. Think about today as we're doing more things like this on Zoom. And you have meetings on Zoom, maybe with clients or with a lender or with an appraiser or whoever it might be. Um, Use the mirroring in this. Uh, This is a great way to uh, do that. So now that you know all my secrets, I expect all of you to show up to next week's training in a baseball hat, glasses, beard. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Mirroring is more uh, posture and are you leaning forward? Are you leaning back? Are your arms crossed? Uh, that type of thing. So, um, and I believe this whole theory is based on rapport, you know, being like-minded. Uh, people want to do business that are with people that are like them. I, th- I think that's the biggest thing, finding commonality there. Uh, number 17, believe in yourself. Uh, we have believe in yourself. I, I love, um, I love the self-help space. I know I'm, I'm probably giving this out too much, but I don't like the new self-help space. I like the old school self-help space. Uh, before it became, you know, everybody, you know, you got 23 year olds on the internet that are, <laughs> that are self-help gurus. And, um, I love a guy by the name of Jim Rohn. Uh, Jim Rohn pre, pre, was the predecessor of a Tony Robbins. Matter of fact, Tony worked for Jim back in the day. I got to, got to meet Jim one time. If you haven't heard of any of Jim Rohn stuff, he's just a sweet guy. That's the best way I can say it. And he, he, he says things in a way that will help you believe in yourself, will get you the motivation that's not hypey. This isn't a hypey guy. But he's just a really nice guy. This is the guy that helps me. If you like Tony Robbins or Eric Thomas is another big one uh, today. They're all really, really good. Um, I like the less hypey stuff. Uh, for me, anyway. Other people like the hypey stuff. So, uh, either way, I'm, he- oh, I'm hearing my... I'm going to put everybody on pause a second. I'm hearing my dog outside. Hold on one second. She might have gotten away here. Two minutes. Take a break. Okay, all's good, people. All's good. See, one of the one of the uh, trials of working from home. Your dog gets away, but she was fine. She wasn't away. Um, Jim Rohn, great guy. Check him out. Uh, I think that for a lot of you, this might be a, a great way for you to kind of uh, give yourself some positivity during the week, and um, it'll really kind of help. It'll really kind of uh, help you with this topic of uh, believing yourself. We're almost done here. We're almost done. We've got a few minutes left. So number 18, this one, avoid the sunk cost fallacy. Now watch this. 
Uh, do you quit while you're ahead or do you just keep on going, never knowing when to quit? A phenomenon known as the sunk cost fallacy is what happens when people are unwilling to stop doing something that they have already invested time, energy, and resources on, thus making a bad situation potentially worse. Uh, instead of seeing it as an opportunity to learn and refine their sales process. You see this a lot when people are having really good success at sales. Um, we've got agents here that have done this, uh, that have really just got into a groove and onto a roll and just kind of hit a vein of, of sellers and buyers that are using them as uh, their agent. And they can do nothing wrong. You know, they go out for a listing appointment. They get the listing. The next door neighbor hears about it. They've got a cousin that, that has a property to sell. They get that listing too. They get offers on those properties in the next two weeks on both of them while getting more listings. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes people lay off the gas during that. Sometimes, you know, they can see the finish line, but uh, they don't keep the pedal to the metal. And that's what this sunk cost uh, fallacy uh, means. And so I would challenge everybody into the market that I believe we're going into today uh, with um, our economy. This isn't something that you want to do. Um, you've got to make hay while the sun shines. And now's the time to make that happen. Uh, you don't want to take your pedal off the metal. Matter of fact, you want to go even harder uh, right now. Just right now. I think until we get through this um, U curve, it, it's going to be a, a turbulent time for some, uh, for most probably, uh, but we will get through this. But now's the time. That's why I'm so glad everyone's here in training and, and uh, working hard to create their business because this is when you're going to need it. This is where you will outpace others that are not doing this for sure. So uh, number 18, we got a couple more here. Um, number 19, let your confidence shine. I'm going to put, uh, I should put that with 17, but that's okay. Let your confidence shine. You're going to sell more if you uh, do that. Uh, when people describe you, do they use the word confident? That's a great way to measure that. Um, the The idea of confidence is uh, been brought out with sales in studies as well. Carnegie Mellon researchers found that displaying confidence is even more influential in establishing trust than post performance. You know, if you can go to somebody and they're really, really nervous in listing their house or selling their house. <laughs> let's flip it. They're really, really nervous in buying their first home. And you could go to them and saying, listen, uh, Mary and Tom, uh, or Tom and Mary, uh, either one, uh, you could say, Hey, Mary and Tom, guess what? I know you're nervous about this process, but I've done this a thousand times. It doesn't raise my blood pressure, uh, helping young buyers like yourself find the home of their dreams. Again, I've done this a thousand times. And while the process can be a little bit intimidating, just know that I've pretty much seen everything that you could see on the planet with working with the first time home buyers, um, from financing to moving in to, you know, uh, getting the deal closed. I'm here for you. I'm going to take the heavy burden of that. Uh, and if you can kind of, if you're coachable a little bit and, um, you can take a little bit of action. I will get you to the finish line. Now, when you say things and deliver that, that's a confidence statement, but it helps your clients uh, feel uh, much better about the position that uh, they're going to be in. So let your confidence shine. Uh, one, maybe two more here. Smile a lot and then act like a doctor. Smile a lot and then act. Smile. And then 21, act like a doctor. Let me explain what I mean by that. John, spell doctor right. So smile a lot. Watch this. Um, do buyers find you warm and approachable? If not, there's an easy way to improve this. Just smile. You don't even have to say anything. There's been a number of studies that show how smiling is closely linked to our perception of how approachable someone is. Dr. Robert Z analyzed what happens when the uh, what happens to the body when 
uh, you smile, which includes increased blood flow, flow to the brain in your brain, if you're smiling, by the way, and the lower lowering of the body's temperature. These result in feelings of pleasure and increased confidence. Best of all, when you smile at someone, it activates the brain of the person you are smiling at. Remember the chemistry that we talk about so much in our sales uh, process. If you haven't got there yet in the modules, that's coming in module number five. Uh, and so that they're more likely to smile back at you. Smiling makes you come across as warmer, and research has shown that when people perceive you as warm, they're more likely to trust you and embrace your ideas. Very, very powerful stuff within sales. And then finally, act like a doctor. Uh, as humans, we enjoy talking to people that ask insightful questions that help us open up and share details about ourselves. Uh, researchers at Harvard uh, studied what happens to our brains when we discuss information about our favorite topic ourselves. Uh, the researchers showed that talking about ourselves is linked to pleasure, and that improved not just our not just our self perception, but also our perception of the person we're talking to. This is why doctors are perceived as trustworthy, uh, specifically. Uh, I'm sorry, respected and friendly because they tend to ask questions that you wouldn't normally answer to others. Boom. Um, remember, I know we've got, we covered a lot here. Sorry for the uh, pause. My dog, by the way, doesn't like an, one particular neighbor. And I'm always concerned my dog's going to get out and approach the neighbor. Not that my dog would do anything, but I just don't want to freak out the neighbor. That's what I thought was going on. It's all good. That didn't happen. But acting, just let me round that one off. Acting like a doctor uh, is really important for you guys as well. Uh, the reason that a doctor is um, uh, an important person with regard to uh, helping someone's health is that they're trusted. You know, they've got certificates on the wall. They went to school for uh, a lot of years. Um, and they're trusted. But one of the reasons they have the right to ask you the questions that they do is because they have put in the work and gained the knowledge and they have the experience. That's why it's important for you as the real estate agent to position yourself as the expert, just like a doctor in your field. You want to be the expert in the market that you're working in. So do are you asking questions about the individual when you're getting with them? in that pre-marketing um, uh, phase or in the marketing phase or when you're on a listing appointment or helping out a buyer, a potential buyer uh, of a property? Are you helping them? Are you asking them questions about themselves? All of these things add up, these 21 things that science uh, says will help us will add up. All of this will be in the agent broker uh, blueprint. Um, Somebody is at the door. Yes. Is it spelled Jim Rowan? Oh, okay. I gotcha. I'm just looking at my chat here. Uh, uh, be the expert in your market. That's kind of the bottom line here. And, and you'll be uh, treated like the doctor if you position yourselves right. So Jim Rohn is, uh, I'll just put it in there, J-I-M-R-O-H-N. That's it. That's how you spell it, Greg. Uh, so appreciate the question there. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, while we're at the top of the hour here, we went a bit, little bit longer than I wanted, but I just, I, I think that information is so, uh, important to, um, uh, people. Anybody, everybody good? Yep. Okay. Susanna, let me unmute you. Hi, how are you? Doing good. Thanks. How do you come about asking your client to take that personality test? How does oh. that very good. Uh, very good. Excellent question. I just have fun with it. Um, you know, my, my wife has taken it. Heather's taken it. Uh, I've given it to other people. And um, I just have fun with it. I'll say, you know, do you want to, you know, and you can do it any way you want, Susanna, but here's a great way to do it. Uh, um, I'll say, you know, do you want a fun exercise to do with your husband or your, your spouse or wife or significant other? I'll say, you know, our office takes these personality tests and we learn so much about who we are, but I suddenly realized why my wife uh, would have an issue with when I presented her with some things in a certain way. 
And, and I go, have you ever thought that? Why did your wife or a husband get so upset when you just say something a certain way? Yeah, I've thought about that before. This test helped you do that. If I give it to you, would you take it and let me know what the results are? Just be real casual with it. Mm. Well, I did practice. Well, first of all, I loved it. And um, I was excited. I'm like, wow, this is pretty good because I'm a, actually, I got the same number uh, amount of red and purple. Okay. And that's, that's absolutely can happen for sure. Okay. So your dominant colors are red and purple. So you're an action taker and you are um, kind of like the passionate fe uh, feelings type person. Uh, which is great. Uh, and so, you know, I know, I, I I already know that by knowing you a little bit, Susanna. So I, I kind of understand that. But the real important thing to do with that data is not only to know yourself, but to know how you react when, when a gold comes to you uh, uh -huh. or a, um, or a, uh, a blue comes to you and says things a certain way. So, uh, you know, your and that's where, that's where, when I took the test, I'm like, okay, well, so how do I interact? So maybe hopefully we could get videos on that on how to yeah. act. That would be so awesome. I love it. Maybe. I'm, I'm a more visual person. So when I see the videos, I'm like, oh, okay, now I know how to control that situation. Yeah. Absolutely great idea. We can certainly do some videos on that. There may be one or two on that module, but we can expand on that. The other thing that I was going to just mention to add on to what you said is that not only is it important to understand how people are communicating to you, but if they're a gold and you are a red and purple, uh, you may be delivering information to them in a way that they don't accept it as easily. You know, golds are very organized and these are the engineers and accountants and that type of thing. So when I'm explaining or doing a presentation to a gold, all my ducks are in a row. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll often say things like, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll talk about organization and I'll talk about the process of what's happening. And that is me talking their language. This is the cleverness that I was referring to earlier that will really, really help out uh, with that. Um, so Dina just took this uh, uh, test. She's a blue uh, so I just find it really interesting to um, find out what everybody is and how they communicate and how you guys use that. So absolutely, Susanna, we can do that. Okay, anybody else? Everybody else good? Okay, well, uh, I want everybody to have a great week. Uh, it's getting beautiful here in the Midwest, for those of you that are not here in the Midwest. Uh, but remember, wealth has nothing to do with money. Uh, success has everything to do with failure. And life is as simple as you make it. If you need me, I'm here. Just reach out. And we will talk to everybody next week on the webinars. We'll talk soon, everybody.